from Acts Law and is it relevant for 2024? Is it relevant in clinical practice? Can we do better than this outdated or old theoretical concept? Now, for us, law has been a cornerstone of osteopathic education for well over a century. The question you've got to ask yourself is, is it relevant and are the laws still relevant for 2024 or 2025? Or are we holding on to an outdated concept that might not be best for our patients or for our practice? Now, Fry's laws were developed way back in 1918 by Dr. Harrison Fryatt, who was an osteopathic physician who aimed to try to explain the biomechanics of the spine. Now, these laws describe how the spine moves, particularly in relationship between side bending and rotation in various postures. Now, for decades, they've been the go-to in manual therapy, especially in osteopathy and chiropractic education, and to this day are still being taught. They're serving as a diagnostic tool to identify spinal dysfunctions. Now, to give you a sort of a brief sort of origin and its fundamentals of Friat's Law, um, you might need a very, very quick refresher. So, to try to simplify it, because it is a little bit complex, we're going to break it down like, num like this. So number one, the first law. In a neutral spine, when you side bend to one side, the vertebra will rotate to the opposite side. So that's rule number one. Number two, the second law. When the spine is either flexed or extended, basically non-neutral, side bending and rotation occur in the same direction. Now, rule number three, or the third law, inducing movement in one plane of the spine reduces motion in the other two planes. So those are the three laws. Now, while these laws have been sort of fundamental in osteopathy and are still taught by many manual therapy training schools, what we've been questioning and what the question you have to ask today is whether they hold up in light of modern research or are people just teaching outdated theoretical, theoretical concepts. Now with the advancement in spinal mechanics, especially spinal biomechanics, more and more practitioners are questioning these underlying principles and are they relevant? Or is it time that we sort of move on to newer evidence-based approaches? We have to adapt. So as we explore the relevance of Friat's law in today's clinical practice, we have to ask ourselves, are we using the best tools available to help our patients? Or is it time to rethink some of the foundational theories we've relied on for so long? Now, let's look at the modern relevance of Friat's law. Remember, now these date back over 100 years. Are they relevant today? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Now, for decades, Friat's law have guided manual therapists, offering them what I class as a, a framework of understanding for basic spinal motion. Okay, but as we've advanced in our understanding of biomechanics, the relevance of these laws is um, increasingly coming under scrutiny. Modern technology like uh, dynamic MRI and 3D modeling have revealed that spinal motion is far more complex than these laws would suggest. Recent studies have shown that spinal motion doesn't always follow Friat's laws. There's variation, there's adaptability. And for instance, researchers like, and excuse my pronunciation, Kolecki and Punjabi found that spinal coupling, how side bending and rotation relate, varies significantly depending on the posture, depending on the load, and depending on which part of the spine you are looking at. It's not painting by numbers. That's some of the key things here. In a neutral or extended postures, you might expect, according to Friat's first law, that side bending to one side 
would cause the vertebra to rotate to the opposite side. Well, however, in some of these studies by Colwicki, they revealed that the lumbar spine, particularly in L1 to L4 segments, which we often see ipsilateral coupling, rotation and side bending in the same direction. This directly challenges what Friar's law predicts. Again, with Punjabi's research, and we're going to go into that in more depth, that adds another layer to this complexity. Now, his findings show that spinal motion can vary significantly across different segments, with some areas following Friar's predictions and others not at all. And this is some of the complexities that we have to factor in. Well, this suggests that the spine's behaviour is much more variable and influenced by factors such as uh, muscle activation, ligamental tension, and even the condition of the intervertebral discs. One of the biggest limitations of Friat's law is that they sort of primarily consider movement in only two dimensions. Now, that is side bending and rotation. But the truth is, spinal motion is inherently three-dimensional. Studies using advanced imaging, um, like those by O'Brien and uh, Dorish, uh, show that spinal movement involves a dynamic interplay across multiple planes. Now, this is especially true in the cervical spine, where Tang and his colleagues observed complex motion patterns that simply don't align with the predictable coupling described by Friot. They just don't work. Limitations in clinical application. And this is not just about the complexity of movement. When we look at the clinical application of Friot's third law, which suggests that introducing motion in one plane reduces motion in the other two, well, research shows that that might be just a significant oversimplification of what is actually really happening. Ebert studies indicate that spinal movement can be highly, highly variable, and under certain conditions, the spine can move in multiple planes simultaneously, not just one at a time. It's this intercomplexity of movement. So what does that all mean for us as practitioners? Well, simply, if we rely too heavily on Friot's laws, we basically will end up with an oversimplified diagnosis and treatment plan that doesn't fully account for the spine's complexity. What we might see as a dysfunction or a restriction could actually be absolutely normal adaptive response to demands placed on the body. Now, this means we could be missing massive opportunities to use much more effective holistic approaches to spinal care. Now, it's very important that as we continue to evolve in our understanding of biomechanics, it's crucial that we question these old theories and adapt our practices to align with the latest research. Now, I'm not saying we throw Friot's Law out, okay? It's been a valuable tool in shaping our approach to spinal manipulation. But as we've seen, they may no longer fully serve our needs in modern clinical practice. That is the discussion and that is the debate. Are these underlying old theories still relevant? My question to you is, is it? Do you think it can be improved? Personally, yeah, I do. Whereas I learned Friot's Law as a student in osteopathy many, many years ago, I don't teach it now at all and not part of a wider process. So this is some of the alternatives that we could consider when looking at motion palpation, differential diagnosis and the complexity of spinal biomechanics.